and welcome to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm Bernie Reno. We go beyond the forecast to give you the how and the why on all of the cool and interesting stuff you've wondered about and wanted to ask in weather space and science. In today's show, we're going across the country to look at how climate trends could impact decisions that people make on where to live. Joining me right now is Dr. Andrew Persing. He is the vice president for science at Climate Central. He also leads the organization's climate science activity. Dr. Pershin, thank you so much for joining us here today. Hey, Ray. Hey, Bernie. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, I, I must say you've had an interesting career because you started studying not climate change, but studying lobsters. Now you study climate. Tell us what led you to what you do now. Yeah, so <laughs> great question. I, you know, everybody has their journey in life. You know, I, I grew up as a kid really wanting to work on the ocean and I, you know, I got to do that. But, you know, climate has always been a part of what I've, what I've worked on. I've always been really interested in how, you know, the physical conditions, the climate conditions in the atmosphere and the ocean, how that affects ecosystems, how that affects the animals and plants that are living in the ocean. Uh, and I was, I spent a lot of my career studying the Gulf of Maine, the waters off of New England. And boy, about in like 2010, 2012, we noticed that they just got, were starting to get really, really warm, unusually warm, and that that was starting to have these incredibly visible impacts on the ecosystems, on things like lobsters, on whales, and on the people that you know depend on things like the lobster fishery. And so that really got me uh, interested in working on climate change, and it got me interested in talking to people about climate change. And for those that don't know about Climate Central, uh, explain to our viewers uh, the work and your and the work that you and your team do. Sure. So Climate uh, Climate Central is a climate science and climate communication organization. We're based in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, what we try to do is help uh, folks like Bernie and uh, you know folks around the world to touch, feel, taste, and smell what climate change. <laughs> excuse me looks like? What is it like to live on a planet that's now at, you know, 1.3, 1.5 degrees C? Uh, and so my team uh, does the scientific work that supports that mission. So we do analysis, uh, we do reports, we do trends, uh, and we try to put, to put that together into ways that make it easy for journalists, uh, for TV meteorologists to talk about climate change and integrate that into the stories that we're telling. Uh, and I think one key thing is that we are, you know, we are neutral, we're nonpartisan, we're not advocacy, we're not here to tell you what to do, but we're here to tell you what's going on uh, so that people can make smart choices. Now, recently your work has focused on how climate trends interact with decisions that people make on where to live. Some decisions may be due to climate trends and others due to changing weather conditions, and perhaps some could be a mixture of the two? Absolutely. So climate and weather are, are intertwined. And I think one of the challenges we have right now is that as climate change is becoming stronger, it's exerting more pressure on the weather system, that that boundary between climate and weather is getting more and more blurry. Uh, but people live where they live uh, in part, and those decisions are based on climate, right? The weather that you expect, the kind of conditions that you expect. And so as the world is warming up, as these climate conditions are changing and they're affecting the weather, that's going to affect the experience that people have where they live. Now, what about if someone loves spending time at the beach? I love the beach, Hilton Head, uh, South Carolina, my favorite location. Now, if going to Hilton Head or anybody is going to the beach, where should they be looking to vacation or move to in the near future? Well, if you like the beach, I'm gonna recommend not moving to my home state of Nebraska because there's not a lot of ocean front <laughs> there. Uh, so obviously you gotta go to some place where there's a beach, but you know, the things to think about, you know, on, on this sort of co coastal environment, uh, you know, a couple of things. The coast is really interesting. That's where you have a lot of kind of climate things that come together. So you have all of the stuff coming from the atmosphere and the weather side. So increased, uh, you know, stronger storms, especially stronger things like hurricanes. Uh, you're also going to have warming uh, and increased, you know, heat risk uh, that, that can play out for people. I know a lot of people go to the beach to stay cool, but, you know, on, on these really hot days, that can be something that's, you know, that's more dangerous and can, can change now compared to, you know, maybe when people went to the beach when they were a kid. 
Uh, and then you also have to think about sea level rise, which is this kind of slow pressure of rising water levels that's really starting to impact uh, some of our shoreside infrastructure uh, in places like Hilton Head and Miami, uh, especially. Well, you mentioned Miami. W let's talk about Florida. Uh, what concerns do you have now for places like Florida when it comes to looking at some of the recent climate trends? So I think, you know, Florida is a really interesting place. So they are, they are sort of ground zero for concerns about sea level rise because they are a very flat state. Uh, they're very, you know, have a, lar a large coastline, and then they have this exposure to, you know, strong tropical storms and hurricanes. So that combined with sea level rise increases that risk. But it also does sort of strange things like, you know, threatens uh, things like the water supply, uh, and you know interacts with their sewage treatment right on these on these days where they get a lot of you know even uh, you know sunny day flooding on very high tides that actually brings some of the sewage that's in people's septic tanks up you know, you know onto the street and you know that's not that's not something that I think any of us want to think too much about obviously Florida is a very hot very humid climate mm -hmm. and that is getting hotter and more humid uh, and so that's going to continue to be a challenge. You know, another challenge and, and something that is of concern lately is air quality. It's a big concern for everyone. Now, currently, where are the best regions of the country for people to go? Yeah, th so this is a this is a big, big challenge. You know, usually the U.S. has done a tremendous job cleaning up our air, right? The You know, the Clean Air Act, uh, you know, and other policies that went into place in the 70s have allowed us to do things like, you know, clean up cities. I just remember, you know, Los Angeles in the, you know, in the 70s and 80s was just really gross. And now, you know, they have, you know, much, much better air quality. But as the fire seasons have gotten longer, as they've gotten more intense in the West, now we really have to deal with smoke that can travel across the country. So it's one of these things where, you know, not where you, you can't really escape it, uh, but there are certain places where you're going to get that, you know, you're going to get those, uh, you know, the impacts of fire and smoke, uh, you know, more often. And that's usually going to be in the western part of the country. But, you know, we're seeing fires in Texas. We've seen, you know, fires in the southeast. Uh, you know, they've been a concern in the Northeast in the past. So, you know, it's a it's a it's a growing concern for sure. And really quickly here, uh, we talked about places where the air quality is not advantageous. What about areas of the country that uh, where the is being impacted the most by air quality? Yeah. So, you know, some of the the air quality numbers that have come out of, you know, California over the last few years for people who, you know, in communities that were very close to those fires, uh, that, you know, those are just really shocking, threatening numbers. But, you know, last year, New York City, because of the fires in Canada and the smoke mm -hmm. coming down from Canada into New York City, New York City had worse, had the worst air quality of any large city in the world, even in, you know, compared to very, very polluted cities that we think of like, you know, like Beijing and Delhi and India. Okay. All right. With that, it's time to get to our first viewer question. It comes from Lisa in Michigan, Lisa writes, what's the difference, and you hear this a lot, what's the difference between weather and climate? Man, this is this is such a fantastic question. Yes. I'm so glad that Lisa asked this. You know, I, I think, you know, in the past, it was really easy to draw a bright line and to say things like, you know, climate is the weather that you expect, weather is the, you know, weather is what you get, right? That sort of like, you know, climate is the average of weather. But cl because climate change is happening faster and faster all the time, it really starts to blur those boundaries. So we actually can see climate change in daily weather. So we can, the easiest way to see that is that we are experiencing conditions on the, uh, you know, across the planet that we just could not experience without climate change. Uh, things like some of the incredibly powerful storms or, st or you know, hurricanes that come, you know, very, very quickly or these, some of these, you know, extreme temperatures uh, that we've encountered, uh, you know, in places like, you know, Seattle and Portland, Oregon and Phoenix, right, that, that those are conditions that we would not have on a planet that did not have uh, humans burning fossil fuels. So, so it's a great question. Uh, you know, the short answer is that, you know, is that climate is uh, climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. But mm -hmm. that line is getting blurrier and blurrier every year. And you expect that blur to continue? as we go forward. 
Absolutely. I think, you know, we we have a lot of confidence in the climate projections. Unfortunately, it's actually a very easy forecast to make because every year more and more carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere. And we know very clearly that the more CO2 there is in the atmosphere, the warmer the planet gets, the more water vapors in the atmosphere, the bigger the storms and, and, and those sort of amplifying risks. It's a very clear relationship that science, scientists know very clearly. Oh, OK. All right, coming up later in Weather by the Numbers, there have been dozens of billion-dollar disasters in the U.S. We reveal three of the costliest and find out which one actually topped $1 trillion. But next, Dr. Pershing is looking at the year-round impacts of climate trends and how this influences where people move. We're also answering more of your question when Ask the Experts returns. Welcome back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm Bernie Reno. We're back with Dr. Andrew Pershing. He's the VP for Science at Climate Central. We're continuing our conversation on places to live and the impact climate change is having on certain areas of the country. Now, Dr. Pershing, let's talk about winter weather. It seems like places like the upper Midwest and the Northeast that in the past have had particularly harsh winters are no longer experiencing those prolonged snowstorms. Winters seem to be trending in some of these locations. Now, is that actually the case, or is it just perception? Well, it is absolutely true. If you look across the country, across the United States, winter is the fastest warming season uh, in just about everywhere, pretty much especially everywhere east of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and so we are seeing, you know, fewer, shorter cold streaks, right? These periods where you're where it's intensely cold, those are getting shorter. The the number of days where it feels like winter, where you would whatever wherever you live in the country, whatever you would think of as winter, the number of days that feel like winter is getting shorter. And this year we're just seeing this play out, especially in the upper Midwest and places like, you know, North Dakota and Minnesota, where they're just seeing very unusually warm temperatures, very little snow. There's almost no ice on the Great Lakes this year. Uh, and that's, you know, that's very much continuing a trend. Now, let's talk about the other side of things. Uh, let's talk about extreme heat. Now, what are the best places to live if you want to avoid extreme temperatures? So, yeah, that's such a great question. And, you know, if so, it would be, it, you know, the obvious thing is to say, OK, well, move someplace north. Right. If you're if you're concerned about the heat, uh, you know, go north. So maybe move to Maine where I, you know, I spent a lot of time. But the thing that you have to think about is the, you know, those places, while they're cooler, the, you know, the infrastructure, the lifestyle there is in some ways adapted to a colder climate. And so those places are also getting warmer. So, for example, if you're, you know, somebody who's tired of the heat in Florida and you buy a place in Maine and you move to Maine, make sure you get a place in Maine that has air conditioning, right? Because not every place does. But the number of days that are going to be hot and humid and potentially dangerously warm is going to increase in, uh, you know, even in places like Maine over time. All right, let's get to our next question, and uh, it comes from Sean in Florida. And of course, we've been talking about Florida quite a bit in this episode. Now, Sean writes, uh, I know some say it's too late to turn things around, but I refuse to believe that. What are some things individuals can do to help limit the impact of climate change? So such a great question. You know, it absolutely is not too late. Every tenth of a degree of warming that we can avoid helps people in the United States, helps people around the world live, you know, live better and safer lives. So it absolutely is not too late. The challenge, though, is like as individuals, we don't control that much. Like our in influence on the climate system is actually quite small. Uh, so, you know, it's tempting to say, OK, you know, don't fly, you know, buy an electric vehicle, you know, don't eat meat, all of these things that will reduce your carbon footprint. And those those are important things for us to think about. But I'd say the one most valuable thing to do is just like what we're doing here, Bernie, today, and that's mm -hmm. talking about it. Right. People don't talk about climate change enough. We don't we don't talk about it with our friends and neighbors and therefore other people aren't as concerned about it. 
And a lot of the social science research suggests that people actually do want to talk about it. They're concerned about it. They just don't think anybody else is. They think they're alone. And so I think the most important thing, the most valuable thing that an individual can do around climate change is talk about it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one quick other question. There's a lot of discussion about El Nino and La Nina. Can you briefly talk about what that adds to the equation when it comes to climate? So El Nino and La Nina, this is a natural swing yeah. in our climate system. And so when we go into an El Nino year like we are now, it tends to boost global average temperatures. So it, it, in some ways, it's like turning the air conditioner uh, lower so that you get so that the you know the planet warms up a little bit more and it it disrupts weather patterns around the world so some of the extra heat that we're getting this summer or this winter is related to el nino but that's happening on top of uh, this kind of baseline pressure from climate change the other thing that we're thinking about and starting uh, is that there's likely a potential going to be a switch back to la nina uh, in the summer, and that would coincide with the hurricane season. And mm -hmm. so you'd have this mix of really warm ocean conditions in places like the Caribbean with then the reduced wind shear that we get with La Nina. And so that could potentially lead to a very active uh, and very powerful uh, hurricane season this year. Yeah, that's certainly something that we're also concerned with here uh, on the AccuWeather Network, that is the switching back from El Nino to La Nina. So that is something that we're both, uh, we're both concerned about. Now, if viewers would like more information on Climate Central and learn more about some of the recent climate trends, how can they do that? So we have uh, our website, climatecentral.org. Uh, we have a lot of resources there. You can do some, you can do things like look at uh, you know, sea level rise projections uh, for places around the country and around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can sign up for our Climate Matters, our weekly bulletin that will give you information on climate trends, especially in the United States. Uh, and then we also have other services like our real-time climate uh, service that will uh, connect you with, uh, you know, weather conditions that have a climate signal, uh, and we can send out alerts based on that. All right. That is great stuff. It is, you know, you always want to be informed. And as you said, Dr. Pershing, ask questions, look at information, and you can come with informed decisions on, uh, by yourself. All right. That's going to wrap up our question and answer segment. I want to thank, uh, thank Dr. Andrew Pershing from Climate Central for joining us. Now, don't forget, when you have a question about weather, space, or science, you can write us or send us a video question at asktheexperts at accuweather.com. You can also call us at 888-566-6606. Coming up next, there have been dozens of billion-dollar disasters in the United States. In Weather by the Numbers, we reveal three of the most expensive and find out which one actually topped one trillion dollars. Welcome back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm Bernie Reno. It's time for WeatherWise and a segment we call Weather by the Numbers. No matter where you live, weather disasters can happen. According to NOAA, here are the most devastating weather events by the numbers. Our first number, 353. That's the cost in billions of drought events in the United States from 1980 to 2023. Drought conditions have impacted states across the country from the southeast to Midwest and many central and western states. Lack of rainfall and extreme heat can also affect so many parts of the economy. Our next number, 455. 455 billion is the cost of severe storms. That includes the cost of damages from high winds and tornadoes that can develop and devastate homes, businesses, and can wipe out entire communities. Also counted as severe storm damage is hail that can smash windows, damage vehicles, and destroy roofs and other property. Severe storms can strike any state. Finally, our last number, 1.4. That's 1.4 trillion. That's right, trillion. Hurricanes are by far the deadliest and most costly weather event. Nearly 7,000 people have died in tropical cyclone events in the U.S. since 1980, and that 1.4 trillion is more than half of the total cost of U.S. weather disasters during that time frame. 
All right, thank you for joining us on AccuWeather Ask the Experts. I'm Bernie Reno. Don't forget, when you have a question about weather, space, or science, you can write us or send us a video question at asktheexperts at accuweather.com. You can also call us at 888-566-6606.